tells what it takes to leave the Philippine Supreme Court. And I say this because I know that his predecessor, Chief Justice Davide, had worked closely with him in, among others, crafting and implementing an ambitious action program for judicial reform. I served in the Supreme Court's Valedictory Committee and was familiar with his boundless energy in organizing this judicial reform conference. It started as an ASEAN conference, but after two years it culminated, to our surprise, as the first ever, the first ever international global conference on judicial reform to strengthen the judiciaries of the 21st century. 300 delegates from 45 countries, among them 45 chief justices, and aided by his very able assistants in the Supreme Court, Mrs. Evelyn Dumdu, who is there, Ivan, Ivan Uy, who is out there, and of course, not to forget uh, the justices of the Supreme Court, Dal Pascuna, Justice uh, Hina Gutierrez, and of course, uh, future Justice Presby Velasco. <laughs> anyway, uh, this was no simple motherhood conference. It brought transparency and computerization for the first time to the Philippine judiciary and those of many other countries. I strongly recommend, if you have not already done so, to look into the results of this meeting. Of course, as Chief Justice, our now, our guest of honor certainly understands this program from A to Z. Now, last, but certainly not the least, he understands the values of family, education, arts, and even music. His only son, Artemio, was a concert pianist, then later on obtained technical, uh, in technical fields two PhDs from the Stanford University. His four daughters all obtained graduate diplomas in Harvard, University of California, University of Chicago, and our own University of Michigan, respectively, with outstanding academic achievements. Of course, our guest also, Mrs. Elenita, Dean of the AIM, has two master's degrees. So for a period of time, our Chief Justice was the only one, the only one in the family, without a graduate degree. <laughs> Thankful, fortunately, there were honoris causa degrees already given to Chief Justice. <laughs> now on a more serious note, I therefore submit with a firm conviction that fate has thrust our guest of honor as the man of the hour with those universal qualities needed at this time to lead the Supreme Court. Consider only the following challenges to the rule of law and its survival. The Supreme Court must now address quickly and bring to closure. Questions of legitimacy caused by a dysfunctional election process. Issues. Issues, various issues and constitutional processes which continually fail to promote political stability, economic stability. Critical business projects derailed by corruption issues. Dysfunctional factions in the military with delusions of being puppet masters threatening the supremacy of our civilian government. And of course, assorted misconduct of many political leaders and their relatives ranging from the strange to the downright pathetic. Some truly embarrassing when you're abroad. It was, I believe, Justice Benjamin Cardoso who postulated that the judge must do two things. To decide correctly, he must first understand not only the law, but business, economics, philosophy, psychology, all of society's endeavors. But to decide fairly, a judge must decide freely what he calls, quote, a method of free decision, unquote. In closing, let me just quote Justice Cardoso on the nature of the judicial process. And I quote, The judge, as the interpreter for the community of its sense of law and order, must supply omissions, correct uncertainties, harmonize results with justice through a method of free decision. 